Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to Newcastle Fast FM. Welcome back to the Baker Broadcast Show. And welcome back to the Baker Broadcast Show as well. We have missed you. We have missed you. And subhanAllah, we have been scrambling and rambling, all sorts of stuff going on in the background. But it is a real pleasure. It is a real delight. And it is a privilege and a blessing to be back online. And assalamu alaikum to all of you, Octavia. Ibtisam, assalamu alaikum. We have missed you, and it is a pleasure to be back. And it is great to see you again, Dr. Abdul Haq. Zaklake, wa alaikum salam, rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And likewise to our viewers, welcome back to everyone. And we're here and ready to go. Yeah, inshallah. Uh, and uh, sorry for keeping you all waiting. Uh, like I said, my apologies for that. And inshallah ta'ala. We were going to try to be, uh, well, well, we'll see how things go next week, but we'll do our best, inshallah, our utmost. Today, sisters and brothers, bismillah, we are talking about after hardship comes ease. And as we've seen these times, there's been all sorts of challenges. We're seeing things move, shift, and just take different directions, different routes. And I think the issues that we're having or the challenges that we're having they're kind of testing us in certain ways. And because, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with this deen and honored us and with this privilege of having this faith in our hearts, it is not enough that it just resides there. It requires from us something more than just the affirmation of this faith. And these hardships that we have, alhamdulillah, due to the blessings of our deen gives us a perspective, gives us a lens in which we can truly recognize the, the, the challenges of what we are going through. As we say, you know, as we've talked about Dr. Abdul Haq last time when we said, you know, we say, Inna lillahi wa inna li rajiun. From Allah we come and to Allah we return. And inshallah ta'ala, we are going to continue on that subject, inshallah. Over to you, Dr. Abdul Haq. No, Jazakallah khair. And I think what you've said is very important for us to, to note um, in these times. And, and we know the verses in the Quran and we're often um, reminded of them. Fa'innama al-usri yusra, innama al-usri yusra. Um, verily, with difficulty, one of somebody's mentioned the, the English translation, verily with difficulty comes ease or the understanding. After difficulty, there is ease, there is relief. Verily, after difficulty, there's ease, um, relief. And the scholars have explained that with every hardship comes a double um, dose of yeah. release, relief in that particular instance. So the ease is doubled following that particular um, trial or that particular hardship. So I think that the, this topic is uh, timely because we should ask ourselves, what will we do with that ease? when it comes, that period of ease, what will happen to our lives as a result of coming through that hardship? What have we learned from that hardship? Are we better? Do we recognize when the ease is upon us? Um, or do we take advantage of the, the ease um, when it's there in a negative um, uh, way, in, using negative um, aspects around that? And if we look at it, like looking forward to what we've missed, how many of us took for granted so many things before this pandemic? How many of us have still got in mind? There's a hope, obviously, that when this pandemic goes, such and such and such is going to take place. And many of, of, thought, many of us thought, OK, this pandemic is going to go within a few months, within a year or so, and here we are and there's no end in sight. And the hope and the anticipation that the vaccines bought, that everything's going to return to normal and you saw everyone um, lowering their guard um, and moving forward like things were going to be okay once again. And here we are. It is the new normal, but what have we missed that we took advantage of and took for granted beforehand? And, and this um, particular show, we'll hopefully look at some of those things. We'll hopefully Inshallah. look at what ease actually means. What does that look like? And then we should look again at this point in time now. How many of us have a lot more time on our hands? 
How many of us have time that we yearned for before the pandemic? If only I had more time to be at home. If only I had more time to be with my family. If only I had more time to read, to write, to study, to watch podcasts, to watch beneficial knowledge. If only I had more time. Now you have that time. We've got that time of ease because we've got ample time on our hands now. Ample time on our hands. But have, have some yeah. of us looked at this as a period of ease where we can seize upon the time that we have to mm -hmm. make up for those things that we haven't had the time for? Or are we looking at this with, let's say, what's the word I'm looking for? Are we looking at it from a negative perspective, lamenting, bemoaning? Mm. What is our approach and what is our attitude at this time as well? Because there are elements of ease at this time regarding our time, with regard yeah. to the space we have to worship. Subhanallah, Jazakallah khair, Dr. Abdul Haq. I just want to say, uh, Walaikum Assalam. I saw some of the names flash up, so if I've missed your name, I'm very, very sorry. Abu Nais, Sabrina, Floating Man, Badria, Lala Rook, uh, Stillness Speaks, uh, Jassi, uh, Avi, Assalamu Alaikum, Rahmatullahi Barakatuh, hello and welcome to you all. Um, there's something I just want to uh, pick on there, Dr. Abdul because you, you've highlighted something. And I think the, there's something during this time of this mass shutdown across the globe that is allowing us to kind of look at things uh, from a universal perspective. Understand? So we're not talking about specific issues here in the UK. We're not talking about specific issues in that country or this country. You know, we're talking about like as the UK, as England, especially everything's on a, on a lockdown. So everybody's kind of gone through that process. And like you were saying, there's, there's two ways we go through that hardship. Uh, and there's an element of where we, okay, we endure it, right? It's there, it's what we've got to do. And like you said, you know, we just take it one hour at a time, one day at a time, one week at a time, we just power through it, right? Or there's that way of actually taking a step back and sort of saying, okay, so something's being taken away from me here, this, this, and this. But what has that opened it up for? You know, like we say, you know, in, um, in physics, you know, that two things can't occupy the same space at the same time. All right. So you're sitting in that chair. That's it. And there's nothing else occupying that, that chair. Just you. Uh, Walaikum salam malahat. Uh, so, so what that even means, the air around you has had to move to accommodate that. Even the air has to move. So only one thing can occupy that one thing at the same time. So with the way things, the endurance and the difficulties that we've got now, these things have moved. Things have shifted. And so we're now in this space of, okay, this thing moved over to there. What has that opened up for? What space has that given? us? You know, and, and what is it that we can sort of do? Not in the sense of, I appreciate what you're saying, like, but I'm talking about what I'm saying is me or, you know, uh, let's say, you know, Lala Rook and, and uh, Abu Nais and Sabrina and all of these sisters and brothers who are out there listening, mashallah, that what is it that they can start to sit, sort of sit down and sort of get a bit more focused on to sort of say, actually, yeah, I can, I can tweak this or I can add a bit more of this and I can do a bit more of this. Uh, I'll give you an example. For me, it's about getting up at five o'clock because uh, as soon as the kids are up, that's it. The kids are off school, they're at home, there's going to be no peace until they go to bed. And what I mean by that is there's just constant stuff happening. There's no moment of silence in the home. That's just how life is. Alhamdulillah. So if I want that time, I've got to get up that early morning. And if I don't get up that early morning, then I'm not going to get any time till the late evening by which time I'm, I'm, I'm exhausted anyway. So that, that day has gone. The whole 24 hours has gone. So I kind of have to wait 24 hours to do it. So that kind of makes me uh, a bit more earnest to get up at five o'clock than it maybe would have been like, well, the kids will be at school. So you know what? I'll steal 10 minutes here. I'll steal 10 minutes here. I'll do something. But I don't have that anymore. So I think in a lot of ways, you know, it's about how things have shifted, but how each of us sort of takes that and develops our own sort of pathway into moving away from being those who endure this to those who uh, flourish in this, inshallah. 
That, that's a good point. I think the, the starting point should be this, the, sticking with the example that you've given. Imagine you didn't have any of that family network around to have to accommodate that time. Hmm. Picture that for a moment. Frightening thought, huh? Yeah, it's kind thought. of a sad thought. It's a, it's a horrible thought. It sucks a lot. Start with that. Like Start thought. with that. So immediately, the absence of that, you look at that and think, subhanAllah, I have that. And there's a gratitude for what you actually have. There's gratitude for that. Despite the stress that it brings us and everything. But the absence of that is something that is, is frightening, is alarming to us in that particular instance. So we need to be grateful for what Allah has given us that may be causing us stress at times, that may be causing us a distraction of sorts, but it's a good distraction in that, that instance. And so what precedes that of the time that we make for ourselves, we know why we're doing that. And for example, we get up to pray Fajr. That is our time to communicate with our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. That should be a point of time and reflection where we are grateful for being able to have that particular time, where there isn't any distraction at that particular time, and it's foundational upon us that Allah has allowed us to have that time with Him. That's the, that's the first thing. Okay. MashaAllah, Tarakallah. We also should look at the fact that some of us are working from home now. The fact that we're still working is a blessing in itself. Others are not working. Others are unemployed. Others are wondering where the rent is going to come from, the food money is going to come from. Okay, so we need to put all of this in a context that when we are thinking about what more can I do or what have I lost with this period that we are facing at the moment, we need to put it in a wider context. You mentioned something globally. You said uh, everyone around the world. It's not just regional that this is taking place. This is global. This is affecting everyone. Okay? The question must be, how is it affecting us? And what positivity are we yielding as a result of that? Okay? Because... We need to look for the ease even during times of hardship. We, even if it's the, the, the individual who's being persecuted physically, he or she often escapes that torture, that torment by mentally focusing, spiritually focusing on a greater level. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the vicar that is being done at that particular point in time. And that's at a point of great hardship, torment. The Prophet wasalam, spoke about that when the, uh, the Sahaba came to him um, and when he was sitting in the shade of the Kaaba and asked, when will um, Allah's aid come to us? And the Prophet wasalam's face became red with, with um, anger, frustration. And he spoke about um, people of old who would have their flesh combed off them with metal cones, and yet that would not make them denounce their religion. Uh, he talked about the torture. Allah. So that physical torture they were going through did not detract from them declaring their shahada. Sumaya, radiallahu anha, the first martyr of Islam, okay? She was killed in the most barbaric way as, as those who know the description of the spear and where it was placed. And yet she did not renounce her religion. So the point of the matter, what am I making here? The point I'm making that even during adversity, we should look for that area that we can focus upon to obtain some ease, to obtain some ease. And surely that, that must be with the focus on our, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because he will be the one that facilitates that double period of ease. Look at Ayub, alayhi salam, when he went through the hardship that he went through for decades and they were saying to him, call upon your Lord, um, and they were talking about his patience and he said, um, how, can he be how can he be impatient? How can he be ungrateful 
for what was it 70 years of heart of 70 or whatever years it was of hardship when it lived that equal amount of ease beforehand that equal amount of ease if not more than the, the ease um that it, it, it overrode the hardship that he was going through so we really need to look at this and i'm applying this to myself though because when the hardship comes we cannot focus on anything else we cannot focus on anything else because it's so hard it's so difficult those of us who are, are, are advising those who are in pain sometimes we've got beloved cancer patients and there's pain and what do we do do we sit there and make them focus on their pain or do we try and distract them from their pain do we try and point them in a direction to focus elsewhere even momentarily because we want to help them to, we cannot do much except to distract them from the pain that they're in so we need to do that to ourselves we need to administer that particular um measure or remedy in ourselves those who are going through hardship at the moment where is that element of ease where is that element of distraction positive distraction and again we come back to the quran where allah tells us verily in the remembrance of allah do the hearts do the heart find, find rest oh, yes do the hearts find rest the hearts find that tranquility, that contentment, that peace. SubhanAllah. Jazakallah khair. Sister Shabnam's message just um, popped up. Walik Masalam, Sister Shabnam. Uh, so, sister, our dear Sister Shabnam is saying that the missing tile theory springs to mind. Uh, that when you focus on a cracked tile, on a perfect wall, it renders the whole wall to be damaged because you're just focused on that, that one thing. However, one must look at the whole wall and not focus solely on the damaged part. Lockdown has difficulties, yes, but equally has plenty of ease. Right. Alhamdulillah. Excellent. Yeah, and Jazakallah khair, yeah, <laughs> Alhamdulillah. And I think there's also, like you said, there's a there's there's an element also of of that awareness of self reflection and what that means. You know, and, and like we talked about, you know, we've talked about it a lot, but sort of realigning our priorities to to understand Actually, because if we, like you said, if you realign your priorities, like despite how frustrating things might be, and I'm talking very much first world problems, you know, this isn't a challenge at all, astaghfirullah in the scheme of things, alhamdulillah, uh, very much in a privileged situation, but no matter how different challenges and difficulties are, you know, astaghfirullah, when you said right at the beginning, what if your kids weren't around, how would that, that was like a, inside of me just fell out, you know, it's like, oh, there was like a void there, it's like, how is this possibly ever going to get filled? Astaghfirullah. And it, it's that realigning of where our focus is and our priorities are that we realize, actually, subhanAllah, there's, there's so much more and there's so, much so many blessings that are encompassed within this that, yeah, if we, uh, I suppose if we open our eyes, not physically, but you know, from a spiritual point of view, that we open our sight to be able to see and recognize it for what it is. Absolutely. I think you gave that example and I think it's a very good example. And I, I've, as you know, I've moved over to Dubai from Jeddah and um, a lot, majority of my children are there and in London. And it was a conscious choice that I'd be here. My wife and I spoke because I needed to focus on the, the new project at hand, uh, which is quite large. So I was here for 12 weeks on my own. OK, this is the first time uh, in my uh, life in my life that I've been alone for 12 weeks. And I didn't let panic prevail because this is a pandemic season. I was thinking, okay, or well, pandemic era, what if my family cannot come? What if I um, don't get to see them? What if I fall ill and um, I'm struck with the pandemic in a very severe way? What if a member of my family falls ill in this particular instance? Now, those thoughts obviously crept in occasionally. But I tried to focus, have a, a routine. Obviously, the, the prayer for everyone here, Muslim and non-Muslim alike, the five prayers, a serious routine that we cannot do without, that brings everything into focus. Okay, so those five prayers were uh, uh, obviously sustained me as they have done since I've been a Muslim, mashallah, coming up for 31 years. Um, the reading, the reflection, okay, um, not wasting time watching. It's easy to, to revert and to, to type and watch, just watch uh, 
Netflix endlessly, binge watching or whatever it is that we might be doing or occupying ourselves with. But to try and, and I'm not saying I'm an example, but the 12 weeks for me was a period which I enjoyed um, a space where I could really think, reflect, appreciate what I had, what I have, and look forward to that re reconnection with members of my family. So when my wife came, my two younger sons came, that period was very special for me. And so when now, my sons would drive me crazy sometimes and they're not doing what I want them to do and everything. Like I said to you, I have to go back and say, well, okay, do you want to go back to those 12 weeks when you were on your own? Um, the answer is no. Um, I still miss the yeah. remain, remaining children in that instance. I still miss my home in Jeddah. I still miss my children in, in, in um, the UK. So we need to look at those periods that we are in and we need to maximise the benefits that are actually there. And in doing that, part of that is the thought process that we're going to be back with loved ones. We're going to re reconnect with the things that we took for granted beforehand because we can't connect with our families as much before. Um, we loved working and engaging with our, our colleagues at work. So we can yeah. look forward to that. Those things are points of focus that we should hold on to. Yeah, Sister Abdesam, you just put up a very poignant message um, and Jazakallah Khair for sharing that. And you're right. Uh, thank you very much for your dua. And uh, subhanAllah, you know, um, as Sister said, may Allah preserve your children with the wajib and protect us all from the sorrow of losing a child. It's the worst test uh, one can be put through. And I pray that can I quickly whoever say has... Yes. Can I quickly yeah. say to it, Sister Ibtisan, you're absolutely right. I know exactly what that looks like and what that feels like. Jazakallah Khair for saying that. And Sister Sabrina put something through which was very kind um, of her, saying that she um, she's with us um, being in this period. And if we and us being with you, us being with you, Sister Sabrina, everyone should realise one thing, that yes, we are here doing this, okay? But we're not here doing this for you. We're doing this with you. We benefit as well. Definitely, definitely, you know, and uh, thank you so much. You know, it, it kind of gets emotional sometimes, you know, especially like, I'll be honest with you, sometimes after our shows, I really feel like uh, overwhelmed sometimes, you know, subhanAllah, with the, with the comments, with the engagement that happens, alhamdulillah, is, is truly, truly a blessing. And like you said, it, it wouldn't have happened otherwise, you know, the, that we are, uh, Newcastle Fast FM went down this route because of the, the way we wouldn't normally done Two years ago, when we were doing Newcastle Fast FM, it was broadcasted on online, uh, not, sorry, across the radio waves, and that was it. You know, Alhamdulillah. So it's it's it helped us move in a in a very progressive way. Just picking up on the other the other side of that, though, like you said, there's one side where we become grateful for what we have, Alhamdulillah. And um, and uh, yeah, just to read that comment, indeed, what a blessing, Sister Sabrina Sukura. Um, it's never nice uh, pandemic, but Allah knows. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what he's doing, alhamdulillah. Uh, and just to sort of build on something else, because Allah talks about those people in the boat, right? And they're in a storm and they call to Allah, right? They ask of Allah, they call to Allah. They're in that extreme hardship, mortal threat right, of loss right. of everything and being drowned and going. And then as soon as the boat comes to solid ground, they step off the boat. And what happens? Astaghfirullah, they... They forget, they forget all of the promises that they made, all of those things, you know, astaghfirullah. Uh, uh, I'm not laughing in that way, I'm just sort of astaghfirullah, like how, you know, we can quickly lose ourselves, forget ourselves of that, that hardship that was gripping onto us. And now that it's gone, it's almost like it's been removed from our memories completely. And so... There is that risk as well then, Dr. Abdul Haq, that, you know, despite us being brought into this acute moment of being nearness to, gaining nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that when that pressure, when that difficulty is removed, that we do not go down the route of being that which is grateful, but we end up being that which is Absolutely. Forgetful. And I think that the, the verse, the, the ayat that you've referred to in the Quran regarding the waves and... Um, 
as as uh, described as described by Allah. Um, uh, wave upon on, on, upon wave and blackness upon blackness, ah. darkness upon darkness. When you put your hand out, yeah. you can't even see it. Those of us who cannot imagine that, and that's the majority of us, I dare say, um, let's juxtapose that or give another, another example that we would all remember to understand that level of fear or close to that level of fear. When we're on the plane and we get turbulence, the plane yeah. is hit by turbulence. And it's hit by turbulence in such a way that you know that the pilot, the captain of the ship, um, you can tell that detectors worry from him. You can detect the worry. You felt the turbulence that the plane has dropped to an extent where the, the air stewards are seated again, the refreshments are locked away. They're there. And when you look in their eyes, because they're professionals, you can see they don't want to have eye contact with you, but you can see that there's an element of concern in their faces as well. And we know at that particular moment, Muslims, non-Muslims as well, we start making dua, we start praying. We start praying. We've seen wonderful examples of individuals who were actually standing praying and they uh, they gave the beckoning, no, let me continue praying. That's all they wanted to do at that time. Yeah. Are we of those people? Are we of those people that the prayer comes to us at that moment and then once we're through that and we're landing or the flight becomes tranquil again, that we revert to the negative thoughts or the frivolities that we're upon, or we land and we forget about what we, we were um, feeling at that particular moment in time and therefore forget about Allah for whatever period of time that it is. We need to look at that time, that period of turbulence when we're call, uh, calling upon Allah. The turbulence is the trial. The calling upon Allah is the ease. We have that outlet to call upon our, last, um, our Lord, subhanAllah, um, every single moment. And how can calling upon Allah in and of itself be a hardship? It can never be a hardship when we call upon Allah, never. Never, when, when, when um, Yunus called upon Allah, when he um, lost um, the, the casting of the lots after he left his people and he was thrown, um, cast into the, the, the sea and uh, the whale, the big fish, as it's described, took him and went to the depth of the ocean. And what did he say yeah. in the belly? The darkness again, we're talking about a different type of darkness, the darkness yeah. of the belly of the, 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 um, the, the whale. He was already in the darkness of night as the storm hit them. And that whale, that big fish, as it's, again, as it's described, plunged to the depth of the ocean. And he said, La ilaha illa ant, subhanaka inni kuntu min al-dhalimin. He called upon Allah at this point. At this point of, we would be, maybe have a heart attack at that point. We're dying at that point. But he called upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that was the ease he reached out for. Allah tells us in the Quran, hold fast to the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we, this is an encouragement for all of us, myself as well, that even in the hardship, there is that ease that we can call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm. So it just, because I, I think there's, because um, it, it, it just runs sort of parallel to that hadith of, you know, the Prophet ﷺ saying that, you know, when that somebody can be a hand span away from from the hellfire because of what they are doing. Oh, by the way, Walaikum as salam, uh, Huda. Uh, and, uh, yeah, so, uh, and you can be a hand span away from the hellfire, but you may do something that puts you into Jannah. And in the same way, you could be a hand span away from Jannah, but you do something that you end, you end up in the, in the hellfire. It's and what is so decreed this, for you. What is decreed for you overtakes what is you. What decreed for you overtakes you, right. So in these moments of difficulty, that's kind of when we see ourselves for who we are then, isn't it? Like, is that behavior of someone who will, inshallah, is decreed to attain Jannah? Do, do you understand what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. I, we don't know for certain, but we know from our reaction. You know, and like there's a story we got told years ago. So uh, when we were looking for our deen, we used to, 
hung out with a few quite different people. There's a beautiful story this this uh, brother told us. Uh, if I just take a moment to tell it, is that uh, there was a an alim and he had a parrot, and he loved this parrot and he taught it how to read the shahada. So whenever you'd go in the room and read the shahada, you leave the room and read the shahada. And if the, his students were very proud of the alim's parrot that would recite the shahada. They'd come, they'd visit, they would just read the shahada. Anyway, one day he's leaving. Uh, he leaves for a place. And uh, on his way back, you know, the, the, the person who's taking care of the property says, look, I've got some really bad news. Because um, a wild animal got in. It got your parrot and it ate it. And he goes, so, so what happened? He goes, well, you know, I heard this sound and I heard that sound and this and that. And I, as soon as I came in, it was too late and your parrot died. I'm very sorry. So the alim became very upset and he started to cry. And uh, his students arrived as well. And they were like, look, Sheikh, you know, we'll... we'll We'll get you a new parrot. We'll train it, this and that. And the alim said, that's not what I'm crying about. What I'm, what's upsetting me is that when that animal was attacking the parrot, in the last moments, in that time of difficulty, when it knew it was about to go, it didn't read the shahada, it squawked. Yeah? It didn't read the shahada, it squawked. And he says, what worries me now is that I've been reading this all my life, and when that moment comes, that I'm not going to read the Shahada that I'm going okay. to um, spoke. Hmm. And, and that, that was upsetting him. And that story, you got told a couple of decades ago now, bro, but it's really resonated with me because it's like, subhanAllah, you don't know till you're in that scenario, in that situation. And I think, I suppose what I'm saying is we're kind of in this slow, slow kind of place where we've, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're in a place where we can have that time to reflect and self-reflect and raise our awareness to move out from endurance into that element of, of joy and appreciation. Because like you said, um, you know, we can be, we can come off that plane, we can come off that boat, and when we touch the ground, we could do a sajda. You know, we can genuinely have joy for, and a gratitude for things, but still have that same elation that somebody else might have. But being grateful from a, a deeper level rather than just a superficial level. Oh, thank God, that's over. Do you understand? Like, and I think there's, there's an element in there that we need to sort of tune in and harness within ourselves. Yeah, I think that comes to that, the other element of the title, looking forward to what we've missed. Looking forward to what we could have missed in that when we realize we're through that trial, we're not only realizing the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon us, we're realizing that had Allah taken us at that particular point, two things, we would be removed from our loved ones, which is going to happen when the inevitability hits us, al-yaqeen, okay, death, but also that we are divorced from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at that particular moment if we are not calling call upon Allah properly at that time. If we are in the moment of panic, inward um, reflection, without connecting with Allah at that particular moment, and all we're looking at is what we are losing of the deen, of, sorry, not the deen, of the worldly life, then we're not learning in that moment of hardship in that moment of difficulty. We're not learning anything at that particular moment. And is Allah's decree that that is what, where we're going to be at? I know individuals who were in some harrowing moments, um, some of us because of our backgrounds and our street culture and everything like that, kidnap, um, doors being kicked off the, the hinges and held at gunpoint. And these things, I remember one of my friends who went through that, we've been through it, I'm not going to go into my history, some people know that. And he said one thing to me, he couldn't call upon us, it was too short, his door had been kicked off, individuals had come. And on one occasion, he said that his disappointment with himself is that he didn't call upon Allah. At that point where he was facing death, Two guns pointed to his head, his door kicked off at his home. He couldn't call upon us, which had come to his mind, like, 
before um, in our past, it'd be, let's make that phone call and we'd all be there and everything. That wasn't possible. He was a Muslim by this time. And so when I, we got to him and said, well, why, why are you, you don't look relieved or anything? And he said to me, I didn't call upon Allah. That's really bothering me. Alhamdulillah, the second time it happened to him, such was our <laughs> lifestyle. Okay. So, <laughs> as I said, we've got, I've got a colourful lifestyle in our backgrounds. Like, yeah. but the take two. Time, take two take now, two, yeah? The second time Let's get it right this time, bro. <laughs> <laughs> but the second time it happened, what, that say, what saved him is that he declared the Shahada and the individuals who had come for him and these individuals were as serious, if not more than the other, they stopped dead in their tracks. And before the trigger was pulled and they said, what did you say? And he didn't want to say it. And they said, what did you say? So he said, la ilaha illallah. They said, we didn't know you were Muslim. We did not know we were sent to kill a Muslim. And they retreated and disappeared as quickly as they'd come because they were Muslim. Because they were Muslim. Oh. Yeah, so there's a lot I'm to unpack that, in the complexities yes, of those things. But I'm, I'm, bring, I'm but, bringing that. But I see right, the point. That, I see the point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because some of us come from that background. As I said, uh, kidnap these things. This was our lifestyle. So the point of the matter is, you're saying that question. How will we be at that moment in time? Um, I, I remember, and I don't want to go into detail. When facing that situation, a calmness came about me, and it's like. Okay, I'm Muslim now. And I reflected, what has got me in this situation at the point where I might not live? And what's happened is there's no one around me except the people who are around me that this is going to be my fate. And I'm a Muslim now. And I was thinking, my past is catching up with me. But there was a tranquility there that, do you know what? Yeah. I, do you know what? I'm a Muslim. And if I die now, I'm going to die a Muslim. SubhanAllah. Yeah. And they couldn't understand why is this individual no. so calm? And even my colleagues who were there and saw the abduction, as it were, were like, we couldn't do anything. We didn't know if we were going to see you again. But as I've said, you hear me say each week, Hasbi Allah and Nikma Waqeen. And really, we've got to ask ourselves and we must pray to Allah. Um, we know um, the ayat, Ya ayu al-ladhina amanu taqallaha wa kulu kawlan sadida. And not that one, Ya ayu al-ladhina amanu, um, I'm thinking of Surah Ali Imran, where die not except as Muslims. Yeah. Die not except as Muslims. Khutbah. Yeah, beginning of the Qutbah Hajj, sorry, my, I'm, I'm not in yeah, the Qutbah yeah, yeah. mode, so... Um, yeah, it slipped so, on my mind. Back up to Qati wa la to mutuna wa illa wa anta muslim. Yes, so... We want to make that dua that we die as Muslims. We want to make that dua regularly that when it comes to the point of death, that the shahada is easy for us. Yeah. How many of us have been with loved ones, parents, friends, and the shahada, we're encouraging them with what? We're not encouraging them with anything else except the shahada. And may Allah make all of us have the ability Amen. to say that shahada at that point. But remember, we need to be able to call upon Allah before that finality in the times of hardship. When we're reflecting on what was past and looking for, forward to what we've missed, there's got to be an element of deen in that as well. And some may say, what do you mean? So why is it we love our families? Why is it we want to be going back to work? Why is it we want to be back out doing things norm normally? Uh, Sister Badia said, uh, Daria said, uh, Badria said earlier on that despite the hardship, she likes walking. The baraka of walking in open space and, and seeing nature and, um, and appreciating what's around us. And you and I spoke about that in the early days of the show in, in, in Ramadan and everything. Just appreciating the nature that's around you, going for a walk. Yeah. Let many of, let, I think every one of us could do with some walking and we may have slight weight issues or whatever, or health um, issues or whatever. But just these things, being able to walk, okay? How many of us are unable to do that? How many of us are unable to get out of our apartments? 
um, because of the lockdown and it's re restricted. We're restricted to being in our apartments or um, going, just literally walking down the road in, uh, on that particular occasion. That's still elements of Ibadah that can be garnered from those particular actions. Okay, so we need to be making sure that what we're missing has an element of deen to it. That being able to walk down the street, see our neighbors and smile at them, giving that charity, that sadaqah, giving that yeah. greeting, being able to go to the mosque or be, if we're in a predominantly Muslim area or society, being able to greet and say the salams to people that we don't even know. Yeah. Well, that should think, be elements you know, and, that we yeah. miss. That, that, there is, and, and you know, there's only so much a screen can do in that sort of sense of interactions and engagements. And, you know, just what you said there, you know, uh, like when, when we talked about our parents, our, our dad passing away, and, and, you know, what gives me that contentment is knowing that my dad did read his shahada. And mm -hmm. the, the amount of pain, alhamdulillah, that just takes away. The grief is still there. But just knowing that, it really, it's like, subhanAllah, like it just took away so much of that pain, so much of that hurt and lo of loss. And, uh, you know, um, Sister Abdesam, I think, just put up a, a, a story there about, you know, somebody being shot dead, but instead of the, the son crying uh, of shock, uh, we felt, you know, was blessed to know that the father had, had read his shahada before passing away. And ultimately, this is, this is, the, this is the sweetest thing that could be on our tongues. When, when we depart, you know, subhanAllah ta'ala. Um, it, it's, it's very profound when you think about it. But I think it was, um, I can't remember, there was another sister put up a message as well, is that if we are in that remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when we are, like you said, yeah, just Allah ruh, jazakallah khair. If we're constantly remembering Allah, praising Him, then it will be easier to remember Allah at the first moment of that calamity. But it's also not just that the first moment of calamity, it's, it's that first, it's not a knock on the door. If, if I can use that metaphor, it's because you're in touch with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So knowing that, that there's an ease then in that sense of communication, in the sense of, right. of drawing back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of gaining that nearness to us. Because some of us, sometimes, you know, I, we wander off that path and then Allah kind of reminds us to come back on. Alhamdulillah. So this is taqwa. Uh, Alhamdulillah is a blessing from Allah. But then there are those, mashallah, who are on that path anyway. So when the hardship does come, it, it, I'm not saying it's water off a duck's back in the sense of its ease, but it's the 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 place a person is spiritually, uh, you know, from a perspective of iman, is so much stronger that they are able to cope and handle that situation so much better. Right, right. Now, absolutely, and I think that we have to continually check our armor of iman in this world. We, we have to make sure that the kinks that are there are smoothened out to strengthen that particular element. We, we've got to continually check ourselves in that instance. And, and those of us who despair, because we all slip, we all have flaws, that, don't lose that feeling of guilt that, that you become so used to what you're doing that that element of guilt is removed because that, that's a hardening of the heart in that instance. Okay, no, but a black stain has been placed on the heart because of what they used to do. We need to continually, continually know that in trying to remember Allah and draw close to Allah, that we need to check ourselves. We need to continually repent for what we may be doing habitually, what we may fall into occasionally we need to check ourselves in that particular instance. And sometimes that can be painful. It's always, it's, it's never easy to, to look in the mirror, okay? And, and so many might say, no, I find it easier. I look at myself like, yeah, what a good looking guy I am and what a good looking lady I am. And yeah, jump back, I wanna kiss myself as James Brown used to say. But no, if we look in the mirror and we stare into our souls yes, really and reflection, okay? When we yeah. stare into our souls, then we need to address us. As, as we're told, take account before you are taken to account. Take account of yourself before you are taken to account. Nasin lawama, that oft um, blaming soul. So we can look forward to what we've missed, 
But as we're looking forward to that which we are missing from before, we need to be better when that thing comes back round to us, inshallah. So when we're with family that we haven't been able to be with before, we want to be a better family member with the people that we're going to reconnect with, a better friend, a better brother, a better sister, son, daughter, mother, father, yeah. than we were when we were with those members before. If it's a job, yeah. a better employee than we were before yeah. whatever calamity like the pandemic has come, come, come to us. If we are waiting for finances to come, that we'll be better with our finances in even giving a, a mm. small amount of sadaqah, a pound or two pounds here, um, than we were when we had our wealth before. So we can look forward to what we've missed, okay? We can, yeah. we can look forward to that ease, but we need to be yeah. better when that ease comes than we were the last time ease was there. Yeah. Inshallah. It's kind of like that, inshallah, ta'ala, because it's, it's kind of like that OS upgrade, isn't it? You know, when you get that thing, you want to upgrade to, you know, 12.1 now or 12.2, and you kind of have to keep keep doing that. Zakul uh, Khair, for your comment. And it, it's that kind of, we're constantly, but it's not necessarily like we're going from 12 to 13 and 13 to 14 in the sense of upgrades, but it's those tweaks that we're constantly looking for those gaps and, right. and, and issues and just keep producing the patches, as it were, just to keep with that software metaphor, that you produce these patches to keep building and building and building. So then when you are ready to step up to the next level, it, it's just another little step that goes from 13.9 you know, uh, to 14. You know, right. it's just a step rather than five or six steps. And it's that, yeah, just that constantly upgrading ourselves by being yes. uh, introspective and recognizing our flaws, uh, you know, in Allah. Because, like, you know, when we are, you know, looking at the mirror, I'm looking that way because there's a mirror there. And when we are looking in that mirror, it's, um, it's when we truly see ourselves, you know, because yes. our intention is what it's going to be judged on. And it might be, you know, astaghfirullah, that our intention gets tainted by, you know, this or that, you know, social pressure, peer pressure, whatever it might be. And it taints that intention. And by doing so, we lose the value of that action or that, 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 th th those words. We lose it right. in, in its entirety. So we don't really know kind of what we put forward for ourselves. But we can understand closer to what that intention should be when we understand ourselves that much better in that relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right. And, and I think as an assurance, a reassurance for all of us, be certain that after that difficulty comes ease. That Shabu double Allah dose, Allah. that double dose of ease comes. Everyone ah. here now listening and who will listen, we say inshallah about everything. Allah tells us here in these verses, Verily, after difficulty comes relief, comes Eve. Verily, after difficulty comes relief. We are given that as an assurance from Rabbis Samawati Wal Arud, from our Lord, from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So those of us who may not be able to perceive or appreciate what we're speaking about into tonight's show know that there will be ease that will come with whatever you're facing whatever you may be going through there will be ease that will come the question is this will you recognize it will you benefit from it will you be better as a result of the hardship that preceded that ease will you waste yeah. that period of ease by doing evil by doing wrong by not exerting in gratitude to Allah because we've been told to thank Allah in times of ease and in times of hardship so many of us when we suddenly get a windfall financially like or a job that's paying all the bills I've made it many of us when we yeah. get to a period of ease and tranquility we're like alhamdulillah that's it we can we can relax now 
And there can be an element of relaxation, but realization that this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It was not on account of anything that we've done. And that the next trial that comes <laughs> is likely to be more difficult than the trial that we faced before. Yeah. So we need to we need to really focus. This is a time of focus. We we are seeing many dying around us. And we're hearing dear friends of mine, dear brothers, I'm hearing of some one's contracted cancer, beautiful, my closest friend actually. Um so don't just be distracted by oh it's the pandemic and it's COVID-19. There are those who are discovering illnesses that are alarming. Mm. There are those who are having recurring illnesses that are coming back to them. And we need to be thinking about them and we need to be asking Allah to cure them. And we need to think um, and pray that we are spared from such trials and calamities and our children and our families yeah. in that particular instance. There's so much to be doing at this particular moment in time that if we were to apply ourselves, if we were to pace ourselves, again, around the five daily prayers, then we will see a structure and a fruition in our lives that will tr truly not only um, replenish us mentally or physically, but we would feel that nourishment and replenishment of the soul, inshallah. And I think this is a period on which we need to really look at that. And this is a period in which we have time to do that. To do that, yeah, yeah. I think so, astaghfirullah. You know, there's, there's, there's uh, something you said there, and um, it, it, it's resonated with me in the sense that you know the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu when they were praying late into the night and their feet were swollen because of their prayer. And Aisha Radilam said to them, you know, all of your past, all of your future, everything is all forgiven. Like you're blessed with Jannah. You know, uh, take it easy on yourself. And the Prophet Sallallahu replied, should I not be grateful? And I think that's right. That's the that's the essence of it. You know, that irrespective of what is going on, that there is so many ways we can flood ourselves with an understanding of how to be grateful flood ourselves with feeling of gratitude for all that we are honored and privileged and blessed with like you said you know there are people who are going through hard hardships in the sense of just they're just even looking at the examples of health that you gave just those examples of, of that struggle of challenges of health that are coming their way it's it's a whole different uh it's a whole different journey but along and it, go, it goes in line with the hadith the again. So, sorry to interject. It goes in that take benefit of five before five. Your health uh. before your sickness. The other one, your free time before you are preoccupied. You Another one, yeah. your life before your death. Your wealth yeah. before your poverty. I've named four there. I, I cannot recall the mm. fifth one. But we need to look at these things now. Uh, brothers, sisters... Uh, non-Muslim guests who are looking, this is all about now in order to move to the Akhirah. This is about now. The reflection on the past is to help us with now, is to give us hope and for us to rectify for the future. Mm -hmm. this is, there's an immediacy to what we are doing. There's an immediacy that we should not ignore. Yeah, Sister Shabnam just uh, commented there, and you experience the feeling of ease after hardship, gratitude for everything is amplified. Yeah, and this is this comes from the sweetness of Iman. This comes from the sweetness of, of being near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, Octavia, there are times that my dua is centered solely around being grateful that I'm Muslim, alhamdulillah. What an amazing gift, alhamdulillah. And it truly is a privilege, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. Right, okay, we're um, yeah, the silence. In the middle of the night, the perfect time for introspection and dhikr. There is something sweet about that time, just before Fajr. Alhamdulillah. You're very right, Floor Iman. Jazakul Khair. Um, I think we're all, subhanAllah, we're just running over a little bit. Uh, but Jazakul Khair for all of you for tuning in. I hope there has been a, a beneficial discussion, inshallah. Sister Badria is saying that sometimes you struggle. That, sorry, sometimes your struggle might feel so deep that you would just prefer to be in your grave at peace with Allah, subhanAllah. 
with Allah pleased with you and only ease from the grave onwards. Subhanallah. That's, that's a uh, profound statement from Badria. And, and I want to pick up on that. And we have six, five minutes, so you're not cutting us short, Wajid. So don't, don't, don't be racing off anywhere. Inshallah, we want, we want to give our viewers their full time. We came on late, mashallah. But no, my point is, what Badria said there, we need to be prepared for that reality that we can get that ease in the grave because we know that the Prophet وسلم, spoke about the torment of the grave. We need to know that the three questions that we're going to be asked in the grave, that they're not just academic questions. And I've mentioned this before, when we are asked, who is your Lord? We will need to have lived upon Tawheed to be able to say, my Lord is Allah. We need to be able to have lived upon the deen and the sunnah when we're asked about what um, was the, the, the practice, um, what was the faith we follow, and, we, and it was the, 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 um, the deen of Islam. What was your deen? We need to be able to have be able to have been on practicing the deen and not bringing in all these um, false and tainted practices, calling it Islam. And when we're asked, who was that man who was sent amongst you? That is not an academic question where we could just answer it. Because these would be the three easiest questions that even non-Muslims could answer if it was just merely academic. We need to have been upon the sunnah of the Prophet We need to have followed him. We need to have loved him more than we love ourselves. We, have need, we need to have had him as the reference point in our lives so that when we enter that grave, we have hope. We have Munka and Nakia coming to us. We have, uh, we answer those questions. We then, that's, remember, we're made to sit up at that point. When the sandals or the shoes or the trainers or Nikes or whatever have walked off in the distance and we are alone, truly, truly, truly alone. And then we're made to answer those questions. We need to have been upon the deen and continually seeking repentance from, uh, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we hope that the person of sweet appearance comes to us and tells us, I am your good deeds. We need to have avoided the bad deeds or sought tawbah from Allah um, that it's not the, the foul-smelling individual that comes to us and says, I am your bad deeds. I only know you to have done evil in the, the, the world. We need to not be intoxicated with life. Because as I've mentioned previously, intoxication with alcohol, which is forbidden, is a better calamity to be in than intoxication with life. Because with intoxication with alcohol, you wake up the next day with a hangover, with a headache, you can regret what you've done the night before and make a resolve not to drink alcohol again. But with intoxication of life, you awaken only in the deep, dark depth of your grave when it's too late. Thanks for Allah. It's, uh... Yeah, subhanAllah. I think... Um... I think we can finish there. Jazakallah <laughs> khair for that uh, oh, yeah. profound reminder. And it is, it's, it's that recognition of the reality of where, where we are and where we're heading to, subhanAllah. And our purpose of preparing for that journey and for being as ready as we can be. And like you said, you know that there are some reminders in this dunya that we, we get the hangover the next day. And alhamdulillah, it's a blessing because it reminds us that actually what we thought was a good idea wasn't so good. It's when we, get, when we deceive ourselves that thinking something is a good idea, but we're not able to get checked on it until it's too late. And when that check comes in, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us and bless us all and keep us upon the haqq. Guide us Ameen. upon the haqq and keep us pure and in the best of states, inshallah. May Allah help the ummah across the world, wherever in hardship, wherever in difficulty. May Allah bless them with iman and honor. May Allah bless them with ease. May Allah bless them with ease. May Allah bless them with ease. Amen. Amen. It is a challenging time, for, like I said, in so many ways for so many different people. And uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us that each 
ounce and atom weight of hardship, whatever we are facing, that we are able to gain nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that, in, in multitude fold. Amen. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides us, blesses us, blesses our families, and inshallah ta'ala, we look forward, sisters and brothers, to catching up with you, inshallah, next Monday, 7.30 p.m. GMT. Uh, and inshallah, thank you very much, very, very much for tuning in. Uh, Jazakallah khair again to you, Ibtisam, uh, Sister Shabnam, uh, and all of you, inshallah. And we look forward to catching up with you, inshallah, next week. So on behalf of ourselves here in Newcastle Fast FM, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Oh.